This was something that like physicians like my father, or others had struggled with during their career, which is this, this testing apparatus, which was one of our topics we want to talk about. Yeah. And we call it maintenance of certification. So you go, you take your board exam when you finish your training in say internal medicine, and it's, it's proctored through this American Board of Internal uh, Medicine, ABIM, which is a, a purported nonprofit, a nonprofit, nonprofit organization, and nonprofit. That, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. And I remember my dad had to take his ten year research and his ten year research. Your dad wasn't grandfathered. Your dad didn't do it early enough. He did. I think because he was um, initially in internal medicine, and then he decided to take the family medicine boards. I see. And he took that, and then he had to maintain after that. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, and it was brutal. Like, but it was. But you know, in a way, I'm grateful for it because he would. Um, um, he would tell me these stories about studying for the test and it was just his way of like feeling engaged in his 60s or 70s when he was doing it. But for us who are out there, you know, we were taking care of patients, you're doing all of this. It is an onerous thing that every few years you have to go and prove that you're still worthy of the board certification right. or what happens. You don't get paid by insurance. So insurance yeah, won't yeah. cover what your services. You can't get privileges at a hospital. Yeah. Um, and you can't say you're a board certified physician, even yeah. though you took the test and got board certified. And you passed it. Yep. It's yeah, that's a good that's really a fair summary of it. And then in addition to it, I think um uh it costs a lot of money. It's a shit ton of money. Yeah. Thousands. It, thousands. And uh it doesn't cost them that much money to administer it. So there's some there's some graft here. There's somebody's getting rich off this board. But one thing that I think this relates to is that recently I saw somebody uh say that chat GPT, you know, is now able to pass the medical boards of, I don't know. 10 out of 12 specials. Like it's crushing the, these tests. I saw that. And they're like, well, soon ChatGPT will be your doctor. And I'm like, maybe there's a fundamental question here, <laughs> which is, do these tests actually make better doctors? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm the first to concede that um, it is possible that, that everyone who graduates medical training are not at the same level. And there's some people who are maybe not fit to practice. So there oh, should yes. be some way to find those people. And it's possible some people, people deteriorate over time. That's right. And, that, and, that, and the term is like unexplained care variation. Why is it that one doctor's doing all these things and the other's doing the other and, and there's no explanation for the difference? Yeah, like yeah. people who do uh, unexplained care variation that's extreme, that has no evidence, that's very costly or harmful. Um, it can be you know a type of malpractice. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that's a problem. And then somebody can deteriorate as they get uh, uh, get further along in their career and maybe not keep up with things. But what is absolutely unproven is whether or not this multiple choice exam, you know, actually solves these problems. The multiple choice exam prevents people from practicing who can't pass the multiple choice exam. But the questions are not real life. Uh, they often test esoterica. They often test... Um, you know, that old saying, why does the drunk look for the keys under the lamppost? Because that's where the light is. <laughs> so in this universe of like medical understanding, there are a few things, uh, you know, uh, PDGFR mutation is hyper eosinophilic syndrome. That's tested, you know, because we know that one thing. But, you know, uh, other things that we may not know that are relevant uh, are not tested. These little factoids are tested. These sort of trivia, in the bits of trivia are tested. And not so much, you know, the actual day-to-day -day practice of medicine. So to me, one of the additional frustrations of the system, and we have, we have to get into the mock part, but the system, when it, prior to 1992, I think, you would take the test once and you would be good for the rest of your career. Uh, I think in the mid 1990s, they made it so you have to take the test every 10 years. And it seems like that's what your dad experienced. Yeah, and I did too. I took it at the 10 year. At the yeah. 10 year mark. Mm -hmm. Now they've stepped it up a notch. The $2,000 every 10 years wasn't putting the profit in nonprofit. So now they have the maintenance of certification where every year, every quarter, you have to pay them so much money and you take a few questions every quarter and they're just raking in cash from this maintenance of certification. They just keep changing the standard and adding one more straw on the camel's back, the doctor who's working every day in clinic. Um, and again, they have really no good evidence that changing this standard is leading to better care, better doctors. They just have no, they're not even trying to get that evidence. Yeah, because they don't want the evidence. And when they have tried, it's been like, what, what, what? It, it, it's, it's simply, and it makes sense because big bureaucracies beget bigger bureaucracies. Yeah. That's just how it is. And when they're making money, like I think Rich Barron, who was the, is the head of ABIM, it pulls in like a three or $400,000 salary and is not seeing patients for that salary. I feel like it's even high. I feel like it's 1 million plus. It, 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 it might be. It's something crazy high. 
for because doing nothing. For yeah. doing nothing. Now we did a, I did a show on my show with Paul Tierstein, who's an yeah. interventional cardiologist at Scripps, and he founded a competing oh, yes. organization yes. that said, listen, he, it, this is onerous. It also tests that maintenance of certification often tests aspects of practice that are not what you do. Right. So as a cardiologist, he was having to do colon cancer screening and things like that. And it just doesn't make sense. So he started another organization called National Board of Physicians and Surgeons. And the idea here is they will look at you every year for how much CME, continuing medical education you're doing. If you get the 25 units of CME and they're quite rigorous about making sure it's legit CME, uh, you get the certification because it just shows you're continuing to learn and do your thing. And there's no evidence that the testing and the MOC helps. So let's just do the CME. And it seemed to work and organizations were accepting it. And then the ABIM cartel uh, got involved and and they're changing. I, I forget the exact exact details, but they're making it very difficult for these guys to do what they do, uh, which makes sense because if you're a large nonprofit making a ton of money and someone's threatening that, and and by the way, these are doctors who are already onerously burdened with. Yeah, let's bureaucrat. talk about the other thing. The, yeah. we got to do uh, the. Uh, Every couple of years, you have to renew your medical license. Yep, and you that was do... twelve hundred dollars for me. Oh yeah, they, yeah. they charge a pretty penny for that. Yep, uh, and th of course they need their money. They need their little kickback too. Yep. Then you have to do continuing medical education CME credits. Yep. To get your license, MOC is beyond that. It's a different thing. Yep. It's not CME. It's another thing that we do. And then many of us are like writing papers and publishing and doing all these other scholarly things. But let me ask this question: Like, it, it begs the question, which is that, let's say you actually cared about a system where you weed out the doctors who are just not good enough to practice. By the way, medical school doesn't do that. They just push them along. Yes, they And do. residency pushes them along yes, because no do. one has incentive to really fire these. That's the, right. The, the 1% or maybe half a percent of people who are just really not fit to be a doctor was a mistake. We don't push them out. You know, they often commit serial malpractice. Yep, doctor you know, death scenario. Doctor yeah, death scenario, exactly. yeah. And, and yeah, from either personality disorder or ignorance or incompetence yep. or these kind of not and, being attentive. And there is collusion, I think, not collusion, there's complicity from other complicity. physicians because they're all afraid that the eye of Sauron will turn on them. Yeah. And so they don't want to call somebody out. You know, it, it, it's very, very, very tricky culture. So that's a bad thing. The next thing is um, uh, there are some people who are... Uh, putting in too many stents, for instance, you know, too right. many cardiac stents, or they're like really practice outliers, or they're doing something bad in their practice. They're not like, they're not a great doctor. Right, like an OB-GYN doctor doing Mona Lisa touch, this laser vaginal resurfacing, which FDA was like, this is not okay. That's the it, Lord's work. It does, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I don't even know what it is, yeah. It, do, it doesn't Some work, trash, you know, okay. only only God can resurface your vagina, <laughs> and uh, but they still do it, and they're still advertising, and they're still charging money for it, so. yeah. So you're right, absolutely right. So there's like these egregious cases. And then there's also the fact that like, 